All right, our, our series is Money Matters. Uh, our key verse throughout this time is for your treasures, there will be heart be also. Uh, and today we're just going to talk about vision. Uh, we're, we're, and it says catch it. That, that's what you do with a vision, right? It's, a, a vision is, is certainly knowing stuff more than that. It's, it's a heart thing. It's, it's a matter of the heart. And it, it's catching that vision and buying into it, right? If you, can't buy into the, if you don't buy into the vision, you can't go any farther. You, and and the, the vision, God will give us some multiple uh, v- visions today for us to take home uh, with us. Um, I don't know, have you ever, how many of you have been to Colorado? Anybody? Yeah, and, and uh, go ahead, uh, put that up for me, Beth. Um, uh, uh, this is a beautiful picture. Uh, I spent 18 years in Colorado. Uh, I was, that was my first call there at a, at a church. And, and we, when we came there, we had two children. Uh, and about uh, a year and a half, two years later, we, we, got, we had our third child, James. Well, somewhere in there, I remember it was the first or second year, um, we were going to a pastor's retreat up near Estes Park. Anybody been to Estes Park? Kind of pretty place, huh? Yeah, it's just awesome. Yeah, it's a really awesome place. Yeah, it was one of our favorite places. And we, but there was this retreat center, uh, and someone had taken the kids for the night. Uh, and so we, we were on a road very much like this, and it was deserted. And we, I had, uh, we had some Christian, uh, 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 contemporary Christian artists, uh, uh, female vocals. I don't remember who it was now, but real low in the car. And as we were driving for about two hours, it, it was kind of an organic thing. Jane and I just started talking about... Uh, really the dreams, the, the vision that we had uh, for our life together as people who knew Jesus. Uh, with, with our marriage uh, and, and what that looked like um, for our children, what we wanted to pass on, including the one that wasn't with us yet, about halfway there, you know. <laughs> uh, and, and we talked for like two hours. And, and it was, you know how some of those things is hitting you, it's like this idyllic thing that, that just sits in your mind. And I just remember the connection we had um, I th- I, Jesus was there, and, and we were pouring out our hearts as to what this vision was that our lives should be like in Jesus. Does that kind of make sense? And you know, it, it's funny, we never, um, we, we never talked about that ride after that. We just kind of took it with us. And, and, and uh, looking back, those, that's the vision we lived in for the rest of our lives. It was that vision that we caught, uh, uh, what it meant to be Jesus people uh, in our marriage and, and uh, in our home with our children and, and all those things. It was really powerful. That's what vision does, right? You, you catch it uh, and then uh, you're empowered uh, to live in it. Um, we're gonna talk uh, about a multifaceted vision today but, but, and we're gonna do it as if each one is an individual but they, they kind of uh, flow together. Um, the first one is the, the vision that God gives us for our life in him. Go ahead and put the Psalm one up for me. Uh, it, and, and we've looked at this with the kids. It says, blessed is the one. And, and, and really that blessed, that word, you could translate it happy, but it's not like a, you know, have a happy up here, but it's rather the, the, the happiness of the soul. Does that make sense? So, so it's not a surface thing. It's, it's a down deep thing. Blessed or happy is the one who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Um, and and, and it, cause, cause those things ne- never work, right? It, it just it doesn't work for you. Do you know what I mean? You, you, you may go there for a while, but, but it, it doesn't work. So, so blessed is the one who doesn't go there, but rather his delight is in the law of the Lord. And, and we always think about, oh, well, this is talking about the Ten Commandments, and, and nothing can be farther from the truth. The word uh, for law here is, is, is Torah, and it, it really means what Moses wrote down. First five books of the Bible. And, and, and greater than that, it means the, the word of God. All right? So this isn't just talking about God showing me how to live my life. It's talking about Jesus. It's talking about the Savior, Right? So blessed is the one whose delight is in this life God gives me in the Savior. And included in that is as his dear child, he, he guides my life as well. But it's the whole ball of wax. It's the whole deal, right? The one who takes delight in that is blessed. And then he gives us this wonderful picture of what this life in Jesus looks like. He says, this person is like a tree planted by a stream of water which yields its fruit in season. Whatever he does, prospers. Have you ever been hiking, um, you know, living in Colorado 18 years, we did that a lot. And, and, um, but you, you went to these beautiful places, right? And this is a really kind of a neat picture where, where, where the water is just so clear and crisp and clean and it's moving. And then these trees that are right next to it and, and their roots go right down into it. And it's like a place of peace. You, you know what I mean? Uh, almost a, a picturesque way of, of showing us what shalom is, right? The peace of body, soul, mind, and spirit. 
God wants you to catch this vision that this is the life he wants you to have. Where you're, you're, the, the roots of your soul are, are deep in the water of life. You know, uh, Jesus said, I am the water of life, right? Um, uh, and, and certainly our roots are deep in him, but, but oftentimes in the Bible, it, the, this water is, is symbolic for God's spirit, his ruach, the ruach that was breathed into us when we were created, the ruach that will raise us from the dead, the ruach that comes to us in his word. His word is never words on paper, just simply words on paper, but it's called the sword of the spirit. So blessed, happy is the one whose roots are deep in that water, that ruach water, right? And, 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 and that's how we live. That's the vision God gives us. Uh, it, it, it immediately uh, made me think of that, that day that we, we were in the Rocky Mountains and, and we, were, we were just uh, uh, pouring out our hearts about what we wanted our lives together in Jesus to be like. Does that make sense? All right, so this is God. God wants us to have this vision. And now I'm gonna, I don't mean to, but I may crash you down, okay? Because what we're gonna focus on in a few weeks is this one. Here we go. What does this look like with respect to your money and is important? Did you, did you go, huh? So I have to tell you, I was really convicted with this the last few months. I've been reading uh, the, old te- the, ma- the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and so forth, and, and with it, the Gospels, Matthew through John. And one of the things that, that I've really been to just hit upside the head is how many times Jesus brings stuff we would hide out into the open. He brings sin out into the open. He brings hypocrisy out into the open, right? He, he, he brings, and he brings money out into the open. He keeps bringing everything out into the light that we would hide, that we say we don't want to talk about. I mean, he talked about money more than he talked about heaven and hell combined. And he talked about money not just with the three, Peter, James, and John, or the 12, but in front of thousands. This stuff was important. He told 39 parables, 39 stories. 11 of them were about money. Ooh. If you have time this week, read the Gospel of Luke. You hardly ever get away from this subject. One out of seven verses is about money. This was just hit me upside the head the last, the last few months. I said, well, maybe we ought to talk about it, you know? Since this is what Jesus does, okay? And it is important. Well, it's obvious to me Jesus thinks it's important, but there's, there's one verse that I want you to see and, and never leave, and this is it. Go ahead, Ben. Okay. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. See, everything flows from this verse. Jesus says another place, you, you can't serve two masters, right? You, it, it's always about the heart. There's another place in the Old Testament that says, guard your heart, Right? The heart is, is what has is that relationship thing with God in Jesus. And, and, and so Jesus, this is so important to Jesus, the reason he talked about it so much um, was because it's so important for us because where our treasure is, that's where our heart will be. And so he wants our treasure in the right place. Not because he needs, you're talking about the God of all creation. You think he needs our treasure? No, he, he wants our hearts. But he says, wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. This first uh, text from the Gospel of Luke, uh, I, I, I love the way this begins. It says, large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning, and turning to them. He says, so large crowds. You know, when you read the text, look for these little words that mean a whole lot. Large crowds. So this wasn't done in the, in the shadows. It wasn't done with three or four. You had a big group of people here. You had thousands of people here, right? And, and Jesus chose to talk to them. And he starts out here, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, mother, his wife, and children, his brothers, sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. You think he got their attention? You get your attention? I bet if we took a poll and you're honest, about 80% of us would want to argue with him. You think? That's called getting somebody's, and certainly he's using hyperbole, right? He, he, he's overstating the idea that he belongs number one in your life. But he meant to. He meant to get their ears. He, meant to get, he means to get our ears, too. And he even goes a step further. He says this. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. 
Now, I, I have to tell you, this loses something for us because we don't live in that culture. But if you had lived in Jerusalem and had seen one crucifixion where a person's back was laid open by the whipping and then they laid this heavy beam on that flesh that was all ripped apart and he had to carry it to the place he was going to die. It was like somebody digging his own grave. huh? You think he would have had your attention? When he said, hey, you got to take up your cross, baby. Jesus has something to say here, okay? And he wants our attention. And now he begins to connect with the people, all right? And, and, he's, and he just starts talking. He says here, uh, uh, if, give me the next one. He says, suppose, you, you had to suppose, all right? Suppose one of you wants to build a tower, all right? Said, hey, you want to build a tower? You, you, you better count how much it is so you got enough money to finish it, right? I remember when we first came to Colorado, uh, it was in an economic downturn, and there were a number of projects that had been framed that were never finished. And, and it took so long for the economy to come up that when it did, and they were going to build something there, they just tore them down because the wood had rotted. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower, huh? Jesus was setting something up here and he was entering into their lives in this very earthy place, right? He said, you, you need to count the cost. Or if you're a king and you're gonna make war, you need to count the cost and if, and if you can't do it successfully, you better make peace, huh? So he has this, he, he, he's gonna have this uh, uh, argument, if you will, from the lesser to the greater, all right? In every story of Jesus, there's one ma major point, one point that he wants you to get, okay? And it's not just this human wisdom of you better count the cost or you're gonna build a tower. That, that's not it here, right? This is where he's going. He says this. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. You see the comparison? You give up something uh, to build a tower, and you give up something to make war, and you give up something to do this, but with me it's different. I gave up everything for you. Life with me begins when you give up everything and gain everything, right, in me. Jesus uh, told another story. He, um, I'm sorry, it wasn't a story, it was a, uh, there, there's another story in the Bible, how's that? And a rich young man um, comes to Jesus. He's rich, he's young, right? He's prideful. Comes to Jesus and says, hey, what do I have to do to get into the kingdom? Jesus says, keep the commandments. He says, oh, I got that covered. I did that since I've been six years old, right? <laughs> I've kept every one of them, baby, I'm good. And it says Jesus looked at him and it says he loved him. See, Jesus, always his words to us are from love. He loved him and he said, okay, Go sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. See, he talked about this stuff a lot. I remember when I was a freshman in, in high school, and um, my dad had lost his job for a year, and then he got a real good job after that, but he lost it, his job for about a year, uh, and, and that summer, uh, um, I, I painted with him. We got some jobs painting, and a lot of jobs in Torrance, I remember we would travel there, and, um, and it, it was a great time, but we worked really, really hard, you know, to, uh, and to, to make a little money and, and so forth. Well, that, that fall, I remember coming home from school, one, one uh, it was pretty late, I practiced or something, and, and uh, here was this guy from church talking to my dad and mom in the living room. They, they were talking about, about money. That's what they did back then. They came and saw you, and they talked, right, yeah. And, and, and I remember, I was, I was um, yeah, I was a freshman in high school, right? A young man just, just feeling physical, you know, so, so I was in that place, and, and my, as far as I could see, my dad was being attacked, and he had worked his tail off, and what the heck were they doing? 
Huh? And I remember, uh, I, it was everything I could do not to walk in the living room and tell this guy what I thought about him, but I didn't. I knew I, I couldn't, he had to have respect, right? But, but my dad uh, walked this guy out and was very kind to him and talked for a while and left, but before he could come in the house, because I knew my mom wouldn't like it if I did it, uh, uh, before he could come in the house, I went out to the front yard and I said, to, and I, uh, in very colorful language, I told my dad what I thought about it, right? And, and I'll, never, I'll never forget it, he, he looked at me and he said, Brad, everything I have came from Jesus. And he can have it all. And then he looked at me again, and he had, he, he had told me when we were painting how you know, a lot, he had been in the war and not many guys came home that he left with. And, and he was getting prepared. They were training him to go to the Pacific Theater. And he says, you know, I really shouldn't be here. I knew that name, that bullet with my name on it was there. Um, so God even gave me my life here. You can have it all. Same way any of you does not give up everything cannot be my disciple. And this is a gift of God's grace. Then Jesus goes on, he says salt is good. But if, if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? So you have this connection. You have this connection between giving up everything for Jesus, which means you get everything in Jesus, right? You have that connection with doing that and becoming the salt of the earth. Do you see the connection here? You give it all up, you become the salt of the earth. Jesus fi finishes it with this. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Us giving it all up to him is tied to us being the salt of the earth. Salt uh, is a thing that gives life and preserves life, right? I mean, I know today we, we look for stuff that's low and salty, but you know why salt is there? So it won't spoil, right? So it won't spoil. If you didn't have salt a, a, a few generations ago, you couldn't have life. Salt gives life and preserves life. We are the salt of the earth. We bring the life of God to all. And it's tied to us giving up everything and receiving even more, right? In Jesus. So, just some, some uh, questions. Can you grasp the vision of giving it all to Jesus? Can you see the awesome gift this is? Everything else um, is it's like fool's gold. Huh? With your uh, money, what keeps you from doing it? Uh, do you perhaps wonder what this means, what it should look like in your life? We're going to talk about that next couple weeks. You can't talk about it all in one day. All right? But I just want to throw it in there. If you're saying, how does this flesh out? Come back next week. Will you rejoice in this? and receive it by faith, all right? Go ahead, Beth. Second vision I wanna hold up for you is God's vision for the world, okay? You got God's vision for you. That, that tree, you know, the, the, the planted in the water of life, the spirit of God, uh, giving it all up for Jesus. That's tied to us being the salt of the earth. Here's the vision of God for the world. Here's at the end of the text uh, of the book of the Bible. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, language, standing before the throne and from, in front of the Lamb. This is the vision he wants you to catch as well, all right? It's not just about me. It's about the whole world, and that's what his vision always was about. Go ahead. In Genesis, it says, through you, Abraham, or Abram, all the peoples of the earth will be blessed. Why? Because Jesus would come through Abraham, right? Jesus would come through Abram. And the vision of God that he wants us to catch is that he would have all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. The vision of God from the beginning was that Abraham, all the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. Jesus wants the whole world to be saved, right? And it continues right through the Old Testament. We don't spend time to think about this. In Isaiah, it says this. <coughs> uh, uh, the father is talking to the coming servant, Jesus. He says, it is too small a thing to, to simply save the people of Israel. 
That's, that's too small for you, God the Father says to Jesus, the, the coming Savior. I will also make you, read the rest of it with me, a, a light for the Gentiles, the whole world. You see the vision of God here? Here we go, the next one for me. The Acts text, yeah. Did you catch that when we were doing that, or were you just reading words? So I put that together sometimes, and I think, well, maybe I should show, but did, did you catch that? The book of Acts is about God continually and, and beginning to bring all the peoples of the earth together. He, he sends, he sends the, uh, <coughs> the disciples out to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Yeah, we kind of, th- we see that, and we go, oh, that's nice, right? Think about that for a moment. You know, in Jerusalem, when the thing of Pentecost happened, right? It was, it was a festival. And so you had the Jews from Jerusalem there, and you had all these Greek Jews. Do you think they got along? You think they liked each other? You think it was a stretch for them to think, well, maybe, maybe this thing's for all of us? And then you had the Samaritans living next door. They, were, they, they, they had a blood feud with the Samaritans. They hated them. But they were going to be witnesses to them? You see, this, this thing blasts through all barriers. Did you catch that? And then the Gentiles. Oh my goodness, they were known as the Goyim, the dogs. They grossed the Jews out. Oh my, they ate pig for goodness sake. And their sexual lives so grossed out the Jews. God's vision just blasts down doors. Did you see in those texts that you read together, every one, day of Pentecost, 3,000 were added to the number. The next one you read, there were now 5,000 men, meaning a lot more women and children besides, right? Then it said the priests were coming to faith in Jesus. Then it says says more and more people were coming to Jesus. The word was growing, right? And on and on and on. Do you get the vision of what the reality of the people of God and our mission with Jesus in this world is supposed to look like? How many times do we shut our minds to this vision of God that he has for the world? That we, we, we somehow think the vision is just about me or us or people close. The vision is for the whole world. We, because of our sinfulness, circle wagons. Where do we do that? Where do we need to grasp the vision of God and allow it to blast through every wall that we would erect? Go ahead, Bev. In this last uh, gospel text, I I love this. (laughs) Jesus, he he went out, he saw a tax collector. Tax collectors are the lowest of the lows, right? I I don't know what what you'd put in there, but they were the lowest of the lows. They were traitors to their people. Uh, and, and they hung out with the low lives, right? Uh, it saw t- and, I'm not, and I'm not calling other people low lives because Jesus came for us low lives, right? So that's right. So a tax collector named Levi sitting in his tax booth, follow me, Jesus said. So what did that involve, following Jesus? He left what? Everything. That's what it involved. He left everything and followed him. So what did this look like in his life? And how did this connect with him? What did it mean that he was a soul of the earth? That he gave up everything, now he's a soul of the earth. How did it all work? Well, you read the rest of the text. This is how it worked. Then Levi held a great banquet. You think that cost a few of his bucks? How many of you had had, 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 a, uh, had a wedding for your uh, daughter? Does it cost a few bucks, huh? All right. Now imagine, you imagine in, inviting five times as many people. A big banquet, it says here. This wasn't a tea. He didn't just hand out iced tea, right? <clears throat> this was a huge banquet so that all these folks would come. It cost him a bunch of bucks. He gave up everything for Jesus, which meant that he used it all in this vision that God has for the world. Yeah. And so all these people came to this banquet. Oh, and you know who was there? Jesus was there. That's what it looks like. It's different for each of us. And yet, there's this aspect of us being together as well. In America, we love to talk about Jesus and me. There is no, there's no simple Jesus and me in the New Testament. 
It's always that reality, but it's always a reality of being tied to the family of God. The, the Greek word for church is ekklesia, and it actually means a gathering of God's people. We live out our lives in mission as part of his people. And church was never, was never an institution. It was always the local group of believers. It was ground zero for the mission. It was the place where we gave everything up for Jesus together as his family in the mission he gave us. We would say the local congregation today, but it was the local group, the local gathering, the local ecclesia. It's where it all happened. And from where everyone left to live their lives of mission and come together to be strengthened the local body of believers. A famous, uh, uh, well, I'm not famous, but well-known pastor uh, wrote, wrote this. Go ahead, Ben. And, and it's, about, it's about the local congregation, all right, the, the ecclesia, the local group of believers. That, that's what the church is here in this paragraph. And this is what he wrote. He says, the church really is the hope of the world. Do you believe that? The church is the hope of the world. The church saved my life. Why, because the good news of Jesus is here, right? The church, uh, it was in the church where I learned purity paves the way to intimacy. It's in the church where I learned friendship. The church instilled in me a sense of purpose. The church taught me how to be generous. The church reminds us we're not the only people on the planet. The church provides the strongest argument of the dignity of individuals and for human rights. The world gives people a scribe value. The church teaches people have intrinsic value. You're created in the image of God. The church inspires us to embrace the one mandate uh, that could and does change everything, the reality of Jesus Christ. And then he says, outside of your family, the greatest investment you will ever make is in the local church. Because this is ground zero for us giving up everything we have in the lives that we live as the salt of the earth in the mission of Christ. Do you see the vision? You see how it connects? Who you are, the vision of God's mission and us being the salt of the earth as we join with him in that vision, in that mission? Okay, go ahead. So I got some questions. Do you grasp and receive God's vision for the world and your place in it? Do you do that? You, you, see, you see you're the tree and the, and the, and, and the roots and so forth and, and the water of life, Jesus. Can you catch the awe of a vision of what we all can do together in Christ? as we dedicate all of ourselves and our money to work in this place and through his place to the world? Now you're gonna say, wait a minute, you gotta flesh that out for me. We'll do it next week, okay? This text, these texts are not about limits. If every single one, if every single one of us gave up everything to God and Jesus Christ is with us in our mission in this place as the local group of believers, are there any limits of what we can do? It's quite a vision, huh? Will you today enjoy, receive this vision and your place in it by faith? You know, this last night, I even I tried, I started to write down things that we have done together. You know, last, even six months, year, and, and, I, and I just quit doing it because it was just words on paper, it was stuff. But I just want you to think for a moment um, of all of the touches we've had with people. The thousands and thousands and millions of touches we've had as a gathering of God's people in this, in this place. Just imagine one thing, that feeding the, the starving children, we've touched thousands around the world. Think about every touch and in, in, in with everything we do. There's a limit as God leads us. This week, I would ask uh, that you think about, meditate, and pray this prayer every day. So I'm gonna send them a prayer with it. It's in your folders, okay? Lord, I receive with joy this vision of living with you as a tree planted by living waters. 
I joyfully give to you all that I am, everything I treasure, including and especially my money. By your grace, empowered by your giving up all for me on the cross, I give it all up that I might know, live with, and have you alone, experiencing the joy of living life the way it was meant to be in this wonderful relationship of love in you. Dear Jesus, I trust your word. Where my treasure is, there will my heart be also. Lord, I also receive your vision given to me that I and we together are meant to be the salt of the earth, joining you in your mission to every tribe, people, and nation who will join me in praising your name forever in heaven. Give me wisdom and insight to see the key part of this local, to see the key part this local congregation plays in this mission and help me to catch the vision of what we can do together in unity as we pledge all that we have and are, including our money, to you and to your mission in this place. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I would invite you to pray that prayer, to meditate on it uh, every day this coming week. That's what I'll do too, all right? Amen. Now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in true faith to life never, never ending. Amen.